Andrew Nembard signs a historical contract for a second rounder with the Pacers. We'll break it all down today. And also talking about the best free agent still left since the Pacers still have some roster flexibility. And at the end, I'll debate. A vet versus Lance Stevenson versus Dwayne Washington. What should the Pacers prioritize amongst that crew? We'll talk about it all today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And today, we are diving into a final-ish day of free agency talk for a while here on Locked On Pacers. Pacers sign second rounder, or at least reportedly will sign second rounder Andrew Nembard to a big contract, one of the biggest, the biggest, really, for a second rounder ever, we'll break down the details of it, what it means and signals for players on the Pacers and the Pacers' plans. We'll talk about the best free agents still out there since the Pacers still technically have a roster spot and some needs. And speaking of needs, last segment here to close out some free agency stuff. Lance Stevenson, Dwayne Washington still out there. Pacers still need some vets. I'll debate the merits of them bringing in any of that kind of player to close out today. So let's start with Andrew Nembard, the big news officially broken first by Jonathan Gavoni of ESPN. Andrew Nembard back to the Pacers' four-year deal. Wow, $8.6 million. Wow, big money for Andrew Nembard, confirmed by a bunch of other people. Uh, Team option on that last season. So assuming the structure is you know, that since option years can't be less than the prior year, and we know the first years are guaranteed, probably $2.15 million per season flat for Andrew Nembard because, as reported by Gavoni, $6.4 million the first three years, eight point six million total. That's the way that that would shake out. So the likely structure for Nembard is a four-year deal with the first three years fully guaranteed at over $6.4 million and $8.6 million in total. Wow. Big numbers for Nembard. Gavoni following up to report that it is the most ever for a collegiate second rounder in the NBA. So historically big deal for Andrew Nembard. And this is sort of what I expected him to get in terms of money. I predicted it a little bit lower based on last year's uh, totals for the 31st pick. But I shouldn't have gone off of that number because Jalen Williams signed uh, with OKC on a big, big contract with the Thunder, $8.2 million for them. And he was the 32nd or 34th pick, excuse me, in the draft this year. He got four years, $8.2 million with a little bit less guaranteed. But that sort of set a market for those early second rounders of like, if your team can afford it, you're going to get big money on big flexibility. And that's what happened to Jalen Williams. He went first. Nimbard, you know, the Pacers had all the space to do this sort of thing, uh, was able to get equally historic money. So that's what happens here. Uh, First three years being guaranteed, I think, is pretty significant. We'll talk about that at the end. And that team option is also significant there. I think the big thing here to me is really this lines up with but also extends beyond technically T.J. McConnell's contract, right? The Pacers' backup point guard spot, their their ball handler rotation is set for quite a while, quite a while. A lot of flux in years past from Darren Collison to Corey Joseph to Brogdon, who missed a bunch of time. You know, they had a lot of guys popping in as the starting point guard. McConnell got hurt last year. They needed point guards like crazy, right? Brad Wanamaker, Keeper Sykes, Lance Stevenson, ton of dudes filling in. Levert was the starting point guard for a couple of games last season. It has a lot of value to lock up that position, especially a position that Rick Carlisle puts a ton of stock in, the point guard spot, having someone who knows what they're doing at that spot or has the potential to grow into someone who knows what they're doing is valuable for a team and valuable in the way Rick Carlisle likes to play. Halliburton, two more years on his rookie deal, then restricted free agency, so at least three more years at a minimum in the worst-case scenario for him. At least three more years, maybe two and a half, because half you're non-guaranteed for TJ McConnell. And now three years for Andrew Nembard, barring no trades on any of those guys. Pacers lock up that spot with guys they like, guys they know fit the way they want to play, and have that rotation set for a while. I think that's good business and good timing to do something like that And I think it's fascinating to see this deal just line up the way it did monetarily, right? That team option, I think, on the fourth year, first of all, is a big deal. 
and, and this is something that we saw with O'Shea Brissett this year and have seen with countless uh, first-year players or young players getting deals with option years on the back end. Because of that team option, it will be similar to what you saw with Brissett this year where the Pacers, after three years, will decide do they want to decline Nembard's fourth-year team option and then make him a restricted free agent with a qualifying offer, or do they want to pick up the option, have him go through four seasons, then he'd be an unrestricted free agent after that fourth season because this is not a rookie-scale deal. So that team option, once I saw four years, I, I mean, every team has the leverage to get that fourth-year option. It's always helpful for the team to get it, but it's also helpful to get three years at least on there so you have full bird rights. You're not limited by the arenas provision or anything like that, which is not worth discussing because it's not relevant. But this is the best structure if you if you really believe in a guy and you want to have him long-term and you, and you would like to have him grow in your system. This is a great way to do that because – you know, three years guaranteed, obviously a big deal. Not such a big number that if he's absolutely terrible, you can't just cut him, but significant enough that you will have the full bird rights, be able to easily transition into restricted free agency. Uh, so that's a pretty good deal for the Pacers, and they can figure all that out on the back end. But I also think three guaranteed years for a second rounder in general is a significant commitment, even with other teams doing things like that. It's just, it's really like that is not unusual, I suppose. Teams do that with a minimum contracts a lot three years at the minimum this is uh more than the minimum too like they clearly have a lot of faith in the future of Andrew Nembard and we talked to Tommy Lloyd the head coach at Arizona after the draft uh when we did a a zoom media availability with with him and something that was interesting is he was Gonzaga's assistant coach for basically two decades prior to joining Arizona so he coached Nembard uh two years ago or at least was on the staff that coached Nembard two years ago and had a lot of high praise for him as a person A lot, but also as a basketball player, you know, the fact that he transferred uh, to Gonzaga and was going to redshirt and then ended up playing there because of a lot of COVID restrictions and things like that and was able to seamlessly fit into a new team, help them be really good. You know, they were almost a national champion that year. Says a lot about what he was in college and now he's growing into that player as a pro. Pacers very clearly believe in him uh, long term and will have the flexibility to keep him beyond that deal and into the future if he ends up popping and fitting in the way that they like. And like I said, he was my summer league crush. I thought he played very well out there in Vegas, five assists per game, led the team, passed well in traffic. I think if he can grow those skills into an NBA setting and still be a guy who can probe into the lane, his speed with the ball was impressive. That's all good things. So um, that is good news for the Pacers. They're now at about 28 million in cap space. I thought it was going to be about 29.8 after the raw signing, but I didn't know this. You can uh, take cap holds back on your books if you offer an offer sheet. And that is, according to Eric Pincus, uh, what they did with Lance Stevenson. So Lance Stevenson's cap hold is still on the Pacers books, mostly an irrelevant factoid. But why get rid of cap holds? You don't have to. Lance back on the books means they're at about $28 million in cap space right now. Still pretty far from the salary floor. In terms of what the Pacers can do, though, signing Nembard means, means absolutely nothing. I mean, they basically can't sign a max contract now, but no one left available is worth a max contract at this point. What does this mean for the Pacers roster? You know, when you sign a guy to the biggest second round pick ever, and some of that is the product of the salary cap environment. Next year, someone will sign a bigger deal than Andrew Nembard, right? But tons of second rounders, maybe maybe not. Maybe this context doesn't line up for a guy to sign a bigger deal than Nembard. There's a reason it's the biggest ever. We'll see. Either way, what does this mean for the Pacers? One, I, I mean, like I said, I think it signals their belief in him. But also, I think, you know, they got to try to get a guy like that who you are putting a lot of stock in their future on the court this year, not in the rotation right away. TJ McConnell should be the backup point guard day one and maybe even the full season. But you got to find opportunities for Andrew Nimbard. He might get a G League assignment if they're really healthy all season or something. But in theory, with a three year deal, he'll be with the Pacers all the time. I mean, he was basically a first round pick, he was one spot away. Like, you have to think of him. I, I've had trouble doing this because he hasn't been signed yet. And he's been like an afterthought in a crazy Pacers offseason. But he was essentially a first-round pick. Like, he's a guy that they will probably need to try to find a way to get on the floor and invest heavy resources of development into. And so that seeing the money jive with that line of thinking means to me that they're going to try to do something like that, get him on the court, get him minutes, try to make him grow as a pro player, which, of course, you should with every young player. But... Uh, this deal sort of signals that as well. What does it mean for TJ McConnell? I think he's the most directly impacted guy on the roster. I still think he'll be the backup this year. But after this year, he'll have one fully guaranteed year left and then a half guaranteed final season where he'll be pretty tradable. Perhaps then the Pacers can explore, especially if Nembard is any good this season, what they want their backup point guard situation to be. Do they want that to be McConnell or do they want him to have a shorter future where he kind of bridges 
an era as I mean, he's their vet this year. TJ McConnell was went from a successful Philly team to a successful Pacers team. He's been on a lot of winners. He also was on the process Sixers, but he was young then. He he's seen what that environment is like. Now he's gonna be a leader for that team. I think he still has value for the Pacers. But I think after this year, especially if Nembard again is any good and shows that he fits in an offensive system. Uh, there will be some conversations about how the Pacers would like to manage the backup point guard spot behind Tyrese Halberton because they have a guy they just drafted locked up for the next three to four seasons. At that point, it will be two to three. So Andrew Nembard, big contract. All that's left domino-wise uh, is Kendall Brown. Zach Pearson reported today that that will be a two-way. We will see what ultimately ends up happening there since there is a lot of two-way exhibit 10 flexibility, but I do think a two-way makes the most sense for Brown, given that he's unsigned and the history of the 48th pick. But we will ultimately see there. We'll, of course, break that down on a segment when it happens. Speaking of that, the Pacers have open roster and two-way spots, regardless of what they do with Kendall Brown. They have a spot. They have a two-way spot. Who could they bring in? Who's even still out there on the free agency market? Let's turn through the best three players I picked out for the Pacers, not in, in total. That would get you like Kent Bays, more Wayne Ellington kind of players. Who are the best players for the Pacers at each position still out there on the market in terms of talent, age, things like that, that I in, maybe could be pursued? I highlighted names that I thought they could pursue. Let's run through those names. Before we do that, though, I want to talk to you guys about BetOnline.net, the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your sports betting needs. You can find all the latest sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games, BetOnline.net, where you can find reviews, and news of every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, even golf. And Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all your sports wagering information from live in game betting, scores, and podcasts. They have you covered. Head over to that website, betonline.net, today, or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in the action happening today. They've got lines up for the NFL season, way more weeks than just week one, like they've had in the past. They've got Colts, Vikings, my Vikings up. That game's in. in Six months. It's December 18th, and the Vikings are favored, if you don't want to hear that. This ad read is not for you, but Bet Online still is for you. Go check them out, betonline.net, where the game starts. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. Hey, they're doing the NFL Top 50 players over at Locked On NFL. If you want to hear more about who is viewed as the top 50 in the league. Locked on NFL is the place to go for you for your next lesson. But let's talk about the Pacers and free agency. Look, we're deep in this process now. Outside of one guy whose name I'm about to say, there are no noteworthy, you know, impact your wins and losses by more than maybe one or two guys out there in free agency. There's some interesting-ish young names, I suppose. But outside of one guy whose name I will say first, the free agency market's pretty barren. And so after this segment and the closing one today, I think Lockdown Pacers free agency talk will be on hold until, you know, Kendall Brown stuff fully trickles in. I, I think Zach Pearson is trustworthy there, and I will cover that potentially in a segment next week that he gets a two-way. Uh, and then it, whatever their last signing is. But I think we will be winding down the free agency coverage here after three weeks on Lockdown Pacers, pivoting into other offseason content, like what this team could look like on the floor, how they will all fit together, things like that. But let's, for now, continue that free agency coverage and talk about the best players left at each position because the Pacers, in theory, have 19 guys in their orbit, 14 guys after Nembard now on a roster spot, four exhibit 10s and whatever Kendall Brown ends up being is only 19. They have a camp spot open. They, in theory, have a need for forwards on their actual team. And if you can get someone on the right deal, anyone, in theory, makes sense. Who are the best free agents available at each position? position now there are some positions the Pacers don't really need anyone like point guard let's start there just get it out of the way because point guard is also where the only significant to me guy who could impact wins and losses by more than a tiny 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 bit this season is and that's Colin Sexton he's the best free agent left he's restricted the Cavs have a full roster it's going to be a game of chicken for them on how the like restricted free agency is on what he ends up getting he seems like he's headed for a qualifying offer situation Cavs will have to do some difficult cut or trade to make that happen. But he is the best guy left. And I, I, especially after this Nembard deal, you know, unless TJ McConnell is traded away, it doesn't make a ton of sense for the Pacers to get him. But if they can get him on a value deal, I mean, this guy put up 24 points a game a few seasons ago. It doesn't make no sense for him to end up on the Pacers. But in in general, the point guard spot, not really something the Pacers will be pursuing with Halliburton, with Nembard, with McConnell, with other guards on the team even who you'd be comfortable with. Having the ball, not necessarily being your primary creator, but if Ben Matherin has it and takes up the floor a couple times a game, 
no big deal. Chris Duarte, no big deal. Buddy Heald, no big deal. They're not creating shots for others, but nominally they can take it up if the Pacers get in a bind. So they don't need a point guard necessarily. You know, Dennis, or excuse, yeah, Dennis Schroeder's still out there uh, as a fine player if they really need somebody. Eric Bledsoe's still out there. And on the young guys' front, like Frank Jackson and Sharif Cooper are still out there, two guys that I kind of like that are young if they need a body desperately. But I don't think that's a position the Pacers will pursue. Those are the best names that make sense for the Pacers still out there, though. And let's get another boring one out of the way. The Pacers have four centers, like nominal centers on their team, with Miles Turner, Isaiah Jackson, Gogo Batadze, and Daniel Tice. They also have Terry Taylor and Jalen Smith, who can play the five in a bind. They don't need anyone at that spot. It doesn't make any sense for the Pacers to jump all out and get a center. The best for, I mean, Luca Garza's out there, the old Iowa big who can, I guess, stretch it out a little bit. Tristan Thompson had some nice moments for the Pacers last season. Hassan Whiteside's been okay in the past, but Pacers don't need anybody. Those are the best names, I guess, for the Pacers at that spot if they end up making some crazy trade where they trade away a couple centers. But any shooting guards you can play on the wing or any actual wings or forwards, those make some sense for the Pacers. And there are some names that are still out there that are not crazy thoughts for this Indiana squad at their current spot. So let's run through the best. We'll start with shooting guards names still out there. Dwayne Washington, obviously one of them. And if you count Lance as a two or a one, whatever. They're both still out there. They make sense for the Pacers as they know the system and things like that. And look, there's another one that knows the system out there. And maybe one of the best free agent kind of wing-sized guys left, Jeremy Lamb. Unsigned, six foot six, microwave score type, terrible defender. Same with Dwayne Washington. Uh, but he's still out there and knows the Pacers well enough that if he's willing to take up non-guaranteed deal, I suppose it would not be crazy for the Pacers to do that. In terms of the rest of the shooting guard market, Wayne Ellington is a shooter who can play on the wing. Might make some sense for the Pacers. Jarrett Culver as a second contract guy, former top six pick, might make some sense. And Josh Jackson, a former top four pick, still unsigned. Perhaps he could be one the Pacers would, in theory, pursue. Again, it might be hard to get any of those guys outside of, you know, your Dwayne Washington, your Lance Stevenson, guys who don't know or don't need a rotation spot at this stage of their career because the Pacers can't really offer minutes at the two unless you are Locked in for sure can play the three. Speaking of threes, there are a couple guys I think at the three that make some sense for the Pacers as the best names out there that make sense. Isak Bonga's a good player. Like, not a good, good player, but like a noteworthy, decent wing who's big. You know, he went through the Toronto development system and showed some stuff. He, he's played for a lot of teams and can't really shoot 30% from deep in his career, but a decent enough defender, good mover, and he's 6'8. You know, I just, I like the way he's able to play. And, He's still only 22. His 23rd birthday is in November. He has four years of NBA experience, a former 39th pick. He's a guy that would make some sense for the Pacers to me with their last roster, roster spot, excuse me, to try to squeeze in and see if they can get a wing who could, in theory, give them minutes if things go the right way. Ben McLemore can really shoot it, former lottery pick kind of guy. Uh, he doesn't make a lot of sense for the Pacers. He's probably looking for a role somewhere or on a contender. But if he is out there, you know, 36% for his career from deep, perhaps a guy that makes some sense. And how about this one? And we'll talk about this in the next segment and in the power forward spot. Andre Iguodala, still unsigned, tons of rings with the Warriors, has played on some good teams in his career, former all-star level talent, finals MVP. I don't know if he even wants to still play on a non-contending team. But Andre Iguodala as a vet, uh, and some of these guys on the next segment we'll talk about, as a vet, that would make a ton of sense for the Pacers. And I'll talk why in the next segment I think the Pacers could use another vet, but they don't really have that many right now broadly speaking. And I think if you can get Iguodala in there to do that, that makes some sense. And at the power forward spot, I have another guy who seems like they would fit that role. Those are the only three small forwards or the three most notable small forwards to me that the Pacers could, in theory, jump all over pursuing at the power forward spot. Some okay young talent, Eric Paschal and Juancho Hernan Gomez, the movie star. Still out there. Still out there if the Pacers need some size at that spot or some youth in Paschal's case. Uh, and if they get him, they could be in the Donovan Mitchell sweepstakes because they're really tight. Those two guys are okay players who are young-ish, could fit the Pacers' timeline, could add depth to a position where the Pacers are somewhat light. And back to the vets, you know, two guys who played for the Nets last year, two guys with deep playoff experience and have been on great teams, LaMarcus Aldridge and Paul Millsap. You know, Paul Millsap's one that you know, he he might be done. He might just be washed. Both of those guys might be washed at this point. But they provide a lot of leadership and, and skill kind of stuff. Like, I remember Al Jefferson at the end of his career, former All-NBA center, the way he was able to – you know, give pointers and tips to Sabonis, to Miles Turner, to E.K. Anigbogu. Even I think he overlapped with Kylo Quinn for a year. Those sort of things have a lot of value, even if they're not playing very much. And that's where those kind of guys can come in and help this Pacers team 
uh, by, by distributing that knowledge, passing it down to a younger squad. Uh, Paul Millsap especially, it seems like the interest in him is pretty low. If they could a four-time All-Star, if they could get him on the team, uh, see how he could help out, I think that would be a decent idea for the Pacers with their final roster spot. And speaking of vets, let's tie this into the last segment I want to do on free agency here, talking about two guys who were on the team last year and, and in theory makes some sense for them now, plus the veteran thing. Between Lance Stevenson, Dwayne Washington, and a veteran, what makes the most sense for the Pacers between those options for their last spot? If those were the only options, what would make the most sense? Let's talk about it. Thank you, as always, for making Locked On Pacers your first listen today and every single day. For your second listen, Locked On Jazz. Here are the latest on the Donovan Mitchell saga front from David Locke, the founder of this podcast network. Hey, I'm stealing this question idea from my radio hit this morning. I went on with Kevin and Query on 1075 The Fan. And I believe it was Jake Query who asked me, Tony, who do you think makes more sense for the Pacers right now, Lance Stevenson or Dwayne Washington? And I didn't have a ton of time to prep for that question. I said Lance right away. Um, I think that it's about even with more thought to it. But I want to talk about that in the context of also adding in a third option of just a veteran in general. And the reason I'm adding a veteran in general is because I also cover the Indiana Fever. And that might make no sense. So let me explain. The Fever right now are, are doing something crazy. They have the tied with the 2020 Liberty, who won two games the entire season in the bubble. Um, the... Few, the most rookies on a team ever. The Fever have seven rookies right now uh, out of 12 players on their roster. That is a good strategy for them. They need to grow like that. It also means they need a lot of vets to plug all that together to teach those players their ropes. And they have maybe one vet in, uh, they had one vet in Bria Hartley. They have kind of another vet in Tiffany Mitchell, but a lot of their good players or returning players, I would not call vets, you know, and they need more. I think the Fever need more vets. Emma Cannon's kind of a vet, but she hasn't been around that long. These are names that you don't know that much, most likely, if you don't keep up with the Fever. But all this to say, having two or three guys who have been around the block and have that sort of, you know, maybe not coach's mentality, but the right mentorship and, and skill passing on mentality is really important. TJ McConnell, even if he's not a vet in terms of he hasn't been on a lot of successful teams, and when he was on a better team, he was much younger. He has the coach's mentality, both because his dad was a coach and because he was effectively an assistant coach last season dealing with his injury. I watched him at practice, you know, be a part of helping with drills and, and being a coach in that way. Iguodala can be kind of that guy as well. I mean, that, that's kind of what he's been for the Warriors. Udonis Haslam keeps getting contracts with the Heat because he can be that guy. That's why I talked about Millsap so much, and, and to a lesser extent Aldridge, in the last segment, because they can also, in theory, fill that role. I think that's something the Pacers kind of need. You know, they're older guys. Uh, McConnell obviously fits the role pretty well, but I think you need more than just one of them. And Buddy Heald, uh, you know, he's turned 30 this year. He's also only been in the league for, I think, six seasons. That's not that long, right? That's basically when Miles Turner started in the league. It, it's less time than Miles Turner has been in the league. No one's calling Buddy Heald uh, a veteran. No one's calling Miles Turner a veteran for that amount of time in the league. Daniel Tice is the other guy that you could maybe squint into. I wouldn't call that because of his age, but he's been around for a while. Tice, however, has not been around for a while, right? He started even after Buddy Heald did, but is also older. He turned 30 in the middle of last season. You know, those guys aren't your traditional vet sort of types in the way that McConnell is, even though McConnell also hasn't been around the league that much. It's just more of a personality thing, I would say, with him. And so that makes me think the Pacers could use another vet in that variety. So, Dwayne Washington, Lance Stevenson, a veteran in that vein. What makes the most sense for the Pacers? Because I think they need another vet. And I also get why Dwayne would be back on this team, because he's a young guard that they have in the past stated that they really like. And that and, and that makes sense. He's another development project. You know, they signed him to a, they basically gave him a million dollars last season, right at the end of the year, a little less than that, because they liked him and wanted to promote him for the work that he put in that season. Between Halbert and McConnell... Nembard, Matherin, Buddy Heald, I, I guess Aaron Neesmith, although I think I'd rather play Dwayne Washington than him at this stage. And Chris Duarte, there's a lot of guys who can kind of be guards for this Pacers team. There's also a lot of guys who can be wings, and so in theory they could use Dwayne as like a third shooting guard. They could also use Lance in that same exact role. But uh, Dwayne Washington is a young guy who even at a logjam spot makes some sense as a quality scoring young guy, even though his defense stinks right now. Having him back on the team, he knows the system, he knows the teammates, makes some sense to me. Now, Lance also makes some sense to me as the fan favorite, as 
for ticket seller as a, not a vet. I don't think, you know, th- there was sort of some laughing from um, Buddy Heald, who actually played with Lance in New Orleans for like half of his first season before he got traded in the DeMarcus Cousins trade forever ago. And he kind of laughed when I asked him about that. He's like, you know, it, it's funny to have Lance be one of your vets. You know, it's, you know, it's not really like, a serious thing. He laughed when he talked about it. And that's not an insult to Lance. It's just, you don't think of him as that kind of guy, even if he's popular amongst his teammates, even if he is sort of a glue guy, he's not the the traditional, you know, coaching style veteran. Even if I do think he has a lot of the skills that are important for that sort of veteran guy, being a very well liked teammate is very important in that, in that vein. So I think Lance could do it. You know, I, I do think he could do it. And that is why when I got asked the question on the radio, I picked him right away. Uh, over Dwayne, but I don't think it's as, as, as clear cut as I answered it right away. I think it's a closer decision, and I think the external vet, you know, the, the Iguodala, the Paul Millsap, the Lamarcus Aldridge, if that guy is willing to take a a no role contract, would make a, more sense than both. You know, I think that there is that 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 highest level of sageness, you know, above what Stevenson can give you, above even what McConnell can give you, uh, would be a very very valuable thing to this Pacers team. Go back in time with me for a moment. You know, the, the first season I was really doing this seriously, like covering every game, attending, the, going in the locker room, things like that. The Pacers signed someone who hadn't been in the league for four years before the season started just to fill that role. Remember Damian Wilkins? You know, a, a half-guaranteed contract to come in. He played in 2012-13, then was out of the league until 2017-18. Pacers brought him in to be that kind of veteran guy for that team. He fit in very well in that role. He even started a game. He wasn't even a bad player. You know, they needed him for that kind of role on that team that was going through a transition period. This team is going through a transition period. You can use someone like that who's played on good teams, who's been around and played on a lot of franchises. And so I think there's merit to that as well. So if I had to rank those things, I would put Lance and Dwayne Washington as a tie. Now I'd put a vet above that, especially one, a vet that would take a contract that is not fully guaranteed. So the Pacers can have some flexibility at the cutdown deadline, as of now, they're only non-guaranteed guys. O'Shea Brissett, they're not cutting O'Shea Brissett. Wilkins, they had on that non-guarantee. Remember, they started him against the Bulls and then cut him right after the game <laughs> because they needed to open up that flexibility. That allowed them to sign Alex Poitras. That allowed them to make minor moves at the deadline and really set their team. They got Trevor Booker in with that spot. Like these, All these things really matter in the grand scheme of things, even though they sound like minor transactions. So the Pacers can get, especially in a non-guaranteed deal, but in general, a really, really, you know, Al Jefferson, Damian Wilkins style vet who's really been around, who's been on a lot of teams, who's had some success and can share that knowledge with the team they have. I think that would make a lot, a lot, a lot of sense for what the Pacers are right now and where they could be headed. They need a guy like that. You know, Tristan Thompson was kind of it for a little bit, the ex-championship winner for the Pacers last year. Perhaps there's other ex-title winners out there that I'm not thinking of. I just keep naming the names that I talked about earlier, but I think that's something the Pacers should think about going after and trying to get. And if they can't, or if there's not one available that makes any sense, circling back with Lance or Dwayne Washington, getting them on the team, both also make a lot of sense to me as guys who already know the system, know a lot of the players on this roster and bring different things in terms of youth versus experience and fan favoriteness (laughs) to this franchise. If you disagree with any of that, let me know on Twitter at T East NBA or comment. If you're watching on YouTube, Uh, that's a very easy way to interact with me directly about all this content. Thank you guys a ton for listening. Hope you enjoyed the free agency coverage here on Lockdown Pacers. And again, if anything big or noteworthy happens uh, coming up, of course, we'll jump right in and cover it. But for now, I think we're going to pivot to more off-season-y stuff, discussing the rotation, who fits well with who, what lineups make sense, how Carlisle could coach this team, all sorts of stuff here on Lockdown Pacers as we pivot into about a month and a half before training camp reopens for this Pacers franchise. So thank you guys a ton for listening. Hope you enjoyed today's show. We'll be back Monday talking Pacers with a guest that I cannot tell you yet, but you won't want to miss it. Thanks a ton for listening, and we'll see you then.